What's up, guys? Welcome back to Taking the Field with Stevie Mac. It is good to be back. Yes, that's right. We are back for good. I know I've played around with the podcast in years past talking about the PLL. Also touched a little bit, especially last summer, on Athletes Unlimited as well. But as you know, largely centered around the PLL. So again, we are back and better than ever, at least in my opinion. And to that end, what's new with the podcast moving forward is that it'll now be video and audio as well, just like it had always been. Uh, weekly guests as well moving forward, not necessarily with this particular episode, but as the summer moves along, as the PLL season moves along, and again, as we get into Athletes Unlimited later on this summer as well, there will be guests involved with that. A couple of them will be referenced, though, on this episode as we get into that in just a little bit. So again, video and audio format now with weekly guests moving forward. And you can still find the podcast just about anywhere you guys get your podcast still on Apple, uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, just to name a few. I believe I saw it still on Amazon Music as well, as there's been a lot of shakeup in the podcast game here of late. Some sites have recently shut down, but again, those are just a few places that you can find it. So on this episode, leading into week one in the PLL for the summer of 2024, a couple things I want to get to with this episode. The first thing is a storyline that I saw which we'll get into in just a second later on. We'll get into some fantasy PLL in the middle part of this episode and then round it out with some picks for week one. So the storyline that I referenced just a moment ago was an article written by PLL uh, Philadelphia Water Dogs beat writer Wyatt Miller, again, one of the people that I will look to get on to the show later on this summer, but he writes an article about the Water Dogs midfield, especially their offensive midfield and just how deep it is and how how difficult it's going to be to to figure out who their group is going to be week in and week out in that offensive midfield and kind of takes a look at that and kind of breaks it down a little bit, especially into tiers as far as who he thinks are locks to be sort of the week in and week out guys in that rotation and maybe some fringe guys and guys that at least at the start of training camp were really trying to battle for some reps, battle for some playing time and really prove that they belonged on this Water Dogs roster. So I really thought that that it was an interesting discussion and an interesting breakdown that he does with that article. And, and it's something that even going back to last season, 2023, was something that we saw with that Water Dogs midfield, especially in the offensive midfield, was just how deep they were and, and how it can be challenging with a group like that to, to get all of those guys on the field and to get all of those guys playing time and, and to even, to his point, to even make the 19-man game day roster. So he does, again, a good job of kind of dissecting that uh, at least in this year's version of uh, training camp going into week one here in the next few days. So you look at their offensive midfield, you've got Zach Courier, Ryan Conrad, Jay Carraway, Jeff Connor, Jack Hanna, Connor Kelly, Thomas McConvey, and now coming back from injury this season, he was a a good go in training camp was Mikey Schlosser coming back from that year-long injury last season. Those are all the players that he lists in that Water Dogs offensive midfield. And really, he calls four of those guys that I just mentioned locks in order to, to make the every weekend roster, that 19-man roster. And those locks that he listed were Ryan Conrad, Connor Kelly, Jack Hanna, and Zach Courier. And I have no issue with those four. I think that you know, if he is fully healthy going forward, I think a guy like Mikey Schlosser could absolutely be in that mix as well. But I have no issue with the idea that he had to come into this training camp, prove that he's once again fully healthy, and once again prove that he can be one of those top four or five guys and be in that discussion for one of those locks because he does fall in this article again by Wyatt Miller. He does fall kind of in that second tier 
of those three tiers. But again, he's that first guy in that second tier. So I think it's more just a matter of proving that he is fully healthy and fully capable of being in that top four discussion. And when I asked him specifically about the D mid situation as they brought four, I think it was maybe five, but I think definitely four defensive midfielders to training camp with them and kind of maybe how does that factor into this offensive midfield situation and, and how they find that sort of balance between the two. So I asked him about the D mid situation and he says that he sees Christian Scarpello and Jake Richard, who they just brought in this off season as locks in the D mid group. And I believe the Water Dogs, for the most part, last summer, if if my memory is correct, uh, brought three defensive mids with them most weekends. So I think with with what Miller said, it's it's kind of just who's vying for that third spot essentially between Scarpello and Richard being locks. One guy that was on the uh, game day roster almost every weekend, I want to say last year, outside of maybe one or two was uh, Charlie Hayes, so it'll be interesting to see if maybe he grabs that third spot again this season or if somebody else steps in and takes that third spot, or maybe it's kind of by committee. Maybe that third spot goes by committee. But to not get too far off topic with that offensive midfield discussion for the Water Dogs, like I said kind of at the beginning of this topic, it's definitely a problem for the Water Dogs. It's a it's a problem that the Water Dogs had even going back to 2023, but at the end of the day, it is an excellent problem to have and uh, I think it was even when I went back and, and reread Wyatt's article again, I believe he said that Coach Tierney even mentioned he he kind of stays up at right at night right now, excuse me with the idea that eventually he does have to contact some of these guys and say, Hey, uh, you, you didn't make the 19 man roster. We, we have to leave you off at least maybe for this week or for the foreseeable future. So I did think that was kind of an interesting quote from coach Tierney in that article saying that he actually stays up at night, knowing that sooner rather than later, that time is going to come where he has to break the news to some of these guys that they weren't able to crack that 19 man roster. Roster. So again, excellent article by Wyatt Miller, the Water Dogs uh, beat writer on that heading into week one. Coming up next in segment two, we'll talk some PLL fantasy. All right, welcome back. Segment two of the show, taking the field with Stevie Mack, kind of previewing Week one in Premier Lacrosse League action coming up in just a few days. Segment one, we kind of reintroduced the show, especially if you're new here to the podcast. Talked the article by Wyatt Miller, the Water Dogs beat writer, talking about the Water Dogs offensive midfield. Touched a little bit there towards the end of the segment on the defensive midfield as well and maybe how that plays a factor in some of the decision making with the offensive midfield but again a very interesting discussion nonetheless let me know your thoughts on that again heading in to week one segment two here I want to get to some PLL fantasy heading in to week one their fantasy expert the PLL fantasy expert Paul LaMonica's top three at each position this was another article that I saw featured on the PLL app and he kind of goes position by position gives his top three and does give a little bit of an explanation why so I kind of break that down here and we'll kind of dive into it a bit at attack he has Asher Nolting Mac O'Keefe and Jeff Teat as his top three at that position. He says Nolting finished second in fantasy scoring in 2023, but for me, I think when I look at that, and then you consider the fact that they added uh, Pat Kavanaugh into that already loaded attack unit with Nolting and Holman, you already have Drenner kind of bumped up to that offensive midfield, and they also have Adam Charlambitis. Uh, in camp as well at attack. Probably could get some run at offensive midfield if they needed him to, but primarily listed as attack. So with Nolting, I think when you have a lot of these different weapons around him, he definitely knows how to utilize that. He can pass the ball pretty well, can rack up the assists, and I think that's one of the things, too, that that Paul mentioned was 
being able to now maybe add to his assist totals and even further his fantasy production this season. But again, it's interesting that when you only have one lacrosse ball and and you have all these different weapons within your offense, maybe that kind of takes some touches away from a guy like Asher Nolting and therefore you see that kind of impact with his fantasy scoring and and that's something that you kind of get into a lot, but you see it throughout the team throughout the league, excuse me, teams like the Atlas uh, going back a couple of years ago with their family style, as they called it. Uh, even the Archers have done well with their riches of offensive talent. Guys like Schreiber, who would t- who we'll talk about in a second. Mac O'Keefe, who again we'll talk about briefly in a second. And just different guys like that, that these teams do an excellent job of finding ways to incorporate every person in their arsenal uh, into their offensive sets and I think the Cannons are just another example of that. So Mac O'Keefe he had was number two and I mean he's just a straight sharpshooter. I got to see him a little bit during his time uh, in college at Penn State. Obviously we've seen what he can do at the pro level as well so I think anytime you have one of these kind of best at their position conversations when you can shoot the ball like a guy like Mac O'Keefe can it's hard to to leave him off a list like that and then Jeff Teat is that quarterback of the Atlas offense I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon even when you add in guys like Connor Schellenberger and Peyton Cormier and and whoever else you know you got Miles Jones first full year of Miles Jones in the midfield for the Atlas this year so and and you even got some guys back like uh, Docs Aiken is back in training camp with the Atlas this year so I think even with that the fact still remains that this is kind of Jeff Teat's offense and it's going to revolve around him and what he can do. And and again, kind of like what I was saying with Nolting is, you know he's going to move the ball. He's going to get everybody involved as best he can. And then it's just up to them to be able to bury the shots. And I think that's something that going back to last season with, with the Atlas offense and with Jeff Teat was that they were getting looks but they weren't burying them and then they started having those troubles kind of uh managing the shot clock and things like that and then that really kind of ground their offense to a halt so I think for them it's just how do you manage the shot clock this year do you make those adjustments uh schematically and do you put your guys in better position to be able to get better quality looks before the shot clock hits, you know, 8 to 10, 12 seconds, because that's really what caused their offense to struggle last year was that they weren't even getting into their offense until there was about 14, 15 seconds left on that shorter shot clock. So how do they manage that this year, I think, will impact just how effective guys like Jeff T can be for that offense. Uh, in the midfield, he has Tom Schreiber, I mean, obviously, uh, Zach Courier, and Tucker Dordovic. Now, this is interesting because you look at this these first two names, you've got Schreiber and Courier. I mean, to not have those two guys on a list like this would have been absolutely criminal. So I think he does the job. Uh, Paul LaMonica, the PLL fantasy expert, does the job here and gets those guys uh, first and second on this list. But I also like the idea of Tucker Dordovic here. I, I kind of was surprised by that at first when I read it, but then you go back and remember that he was the reigning uh, rookie of the year in the PLL, and then it kind of makes more sense. And I think it really kind of rounds out that top three of Schreiber, Courier, and Dordovic because Schreiber, I mean, we know what he can do. He can shoot, and his his, his ability to pass the ball has has basically become an adjective in itself. And then you look at a guy like Zach Courier, kind of that do-it-all midfielder. He's an offensive midi. He's a defensive midi. He can take face off if you need to. Like He can just do so many different things, and his stat lines week in and week out are just ridiculous. And again, you've got Dordovic as the reigning rookie of the year. On defense, he has Will Bowen, Garrett Eppel, and Michael Rexrode. Bowen was just an absolute stud last year, and 
and Andy Towers made sure to tell everyone as much as the season went along. I mean, the the proof was in the film, to be honest with you. I mean, you can go back and look some of, at some of his highlights from last season, and you can understand why he is front and center on this list of top three at his position. Uh, Epples found a new home on the Cannons this year. Cannons made a couple moves to bring in some guys on defense, Epple being one of those. And I've I've really liked their focus in trying to build up their defense as much as possible in what has become a extremely offensive league. Uh, the job that Coach Holman has done as the quote-unquote GM of this team to bring in guys last year. You look at Max Wayne and, and Cade Van Raphorst, who for whatever reason were let go by the Atlas, and then the Atlas had their struggles defensively last year, but they were let go by the Atlas. He brings them in. They basically become starters for the for the Cannons defense from, from day one, essentially. And then this year, he kind of does it again by bringing in a guy like Garrett Apple um, and a few other pieces as well. And then I'm excited to see what Rex wrote as he was the third guy mentioned on this list, Michael Rex wrote. I'm interested to see what he can do being more of a leader of this Atlas defense. You lose uh, Tucker Durkin as a free agent last off season and now potentially kind of turning the defensive leadership role over to Rex Road. You've got Adler, you've got Maycar, Kobe Smith looks like he's back and ready to go for this season, and you know, you've know you done a few other things on the defensive side. You've got Troutner in the goal. I believe sooner rather than later, I wouldn't be surprised if Liam Ettenman uh, eventually became the starter in the cage for the Atlas at some point in time, kind of like what, uh, what Curse did a couple of years ago for the camp where it was Gittleman at first and then eventually they turned it over to Kirst in the goal. I kind of I kind of envision a similar transition uh, for the Atlas there, but I'm interested to see if the Atlas defense can kind of figure it out this year. Maycar and, and Adler, as I said, now have a year under their belt. See what Kobe Smith can, can add to this defense, if he can be back uh, in a full-time capacity. And then at goalie, he has Blaze Reardon, Brett Dobson, and Colin Kirst. Again, I have no issue with any of these three, kind of similar to what I said with the midi. It'd be hard to have this kind of a discussion and leave somebody like Blaze Reardon off of it. I think Dobson was a huge piece to that Archers championship team last summer. And then Colin Kirst, I think, can have that kind of an impact to the Cannons the way that Dobson did last season with the Archers. I think that there's a lot of similarities between those two with this year's version of the Cannons and what we saw last year with the Archers, but again, we can talk more about that in later episodes. So my fantasy team um, for, or excuse me, uh, face-off was the was the last category, Baptiste, Trevor Baptiste, uh, Mike Sisselberger, and T.D. Erlen. Again, I don't think it's that big of a stretch that these three are in that conversation. I think that they're the best of the best at that position, maybe going into the season. I think that uh, somebody like Nardella could make a case for being in that trio as well, but did miss uh, last year. Uh, with an injury. So, I mean, these three are probably the best of the best going into the season, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if by season's end uh, that's still the case. So now getting to my week one fantasy lineup again in PLL Fantasy, you get 200 cap points to play with to assemble your roster. You get two attack, two middies, a defender, a goalie, and a face-off. And my lineup for week one in the PLL reads like this. At attack, I have Michael Sowers, who was 35 points against my cap, and Logan Wisnowskis, who was 26 points against. Uh, in the midfield, I have Zach Courier, who was 31 points against the cap, and Kyle Jackson at 18. Jackson was kind of like the throw-in at the end. I had really pieced together... Uh, my entire roster almost by the time that I got to Jackson. I had that one spot left in my midfield. I had the 18 points left, and he was sitting there right at 18 points against the cap. So I figured I'd take the shot 
Um, Chaos like to move the ball. They've got guys that can distribute the ball pretty well, whether it be attack or midfield. I remember last summer I talked in one episode about just the positionless lacrosse that they like to play uh, on offense. Andy Towers in one of his post-game press conferences kind of talked a little bit about that after one of their games. So I think Jackson, even though he's not one of like the feature pieces of that of that offense. I think he will get his opportunities this summer. And again, he was kind of just that player that I plugged in at the very end after I had filled out the rest of my lineup. Um, on defense, I have Cade Van Raphorst, who was actually only 18 points against the cap. I was kind of surprised at that. I thought he'd at least be a few points higher, but I'm not going to complain if I can get him at 18. My goalie is Colin Kirst. Originally, I had Blaze Reardon as my goalie, but when I had to move some pieces around and, and try some different things, I wound up with Colin Kirst, which, by all things, is not the worst consolation prize in the world. He was a 33-point cap hit. And then my face-off guy is Trevor Baptiste in Game 1 against the Cannons. Now, that's something interesting, is now because of the way the schedule works with the sort of home home field each weekend for one of the teams the atlas will get two home games in week one because they're the i guess quote unquote home team uh in albany in week one so you'll get the atlas on saturday in their game against the cannons and then the following day on sunday against the whip snakes so i took trevor baptiste in game one against the cannons for a 39 point cap hit which wipes out all 200 of my cap points that i had to work with and again that rundown real quick at attack michael sowers logan wasnowskis midfield was zach courier and kyle jackson defense was Cade van raphorst goalie is colin kirst and faceoff was trevor baptiste in the third and final segment of this episode on taking the field with stevie mack we'll wrap up the show talking our week one pll picks All right, welcome back. Final segment of the show leading into week one in PLL action, getting to our week one picks. Top of the show, we talked about the Water Dogs offensive midfield situation from the article by Wyatt Miller, their PLL beat writer. Segment two, we dove deep into some PLL fantasy. Go back and hit the rewind button for segment two to get my thoughts uh, for week one with my fantasy lineup. And also the article by Paul LaMonica giving his top three players at each position for week one in fantasy lacrosse. That was an excellent article by Paul LaMonica. And I did a little bit of a deep dive into that. But here in segment three, as promised, we will get to the week one picks for the first game of the 2024 season, the Archers and the Water Dogs, my pick for that game is Kieran McArdle to go over three and a half points at minus 120. Excuse me. All of these odds and these picks are through DraftKings Sportsbook. So again, Kieran McArdle over three and a half points at minus 120. And my reasoning behind it was in 2023, he averaged three and a half points a game against the Archers in two games last season he also had two of his better shooting games by percentages in those games against the archers and for the season overall he had four total games of four points or more including a seven point game in the first half of the year i believe if i remember correctly that was against the whip snakes and then the following game they took on the archers and still had a pretty good game in that matchup against the archers he averaged 32 and a half touches per game in those two games against the archers last season and i think that with the stacked offensive midfield group like we talked about in segment one and then you add in a guy like michael sowers uh, at attack uh, along with Kieran McArdle, I feel like McArdle 
will almost kind of be forgotten about at times by opposing defenses because you have to deal with all the firepower from the offensive midfield. You have to deal with a guy like Sowers who can do a lot of different things from behind the cage, sort of quarterbacking that offense. So in a weird way, I feel like McArdle could be kind of like the forgotten piece to that water dogs offensive puzzle for opposing defenses. And I think that could allow for him to kind of get off to a, a pretty hot start here in week one, or at least that's what I'm banking on. So again, Kieran McArdle over three and a half points against the archers in the Atlas and cannons game. I'm actually going to take the Atlas money line at plus one Oh five here. Cause I think that while, and I talked about this earlier in the episode, while the cannons added to their defense with guys like Garrett Apple and Matt Dunn, and they added a guy like Kavanaugh at attack with his brother, Matt. I think that because the Atlas still have Trevor Baptiste at faceoff, I don't think or I don't foresee a guy like Zach Tucci really winning that matchup or, or I guess really making it all that close against Baptiste. So I think that Baptiste in this game could be kind of like the great equalizer. But again, kind of what I was saying before with Baptiste is if the Atlas can figure out their troubles with the shot clock like they had last season, and even if you can get the occasional stop on defense, which again, they struggled at times to do last season, I think that in a case like this, and maybe even looking ahead to Sunday's matchup with the Whipsnakes, I think Baptiste kind of becomes that 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 thing that sort of tilts the game in your favor because you saw it even with their struggles last season the fact that he was able to win 70 80 plus percent of his faceoffs really tilted the field in their favor now they just have to figure out how to put the ball in the back of the net so again i've got the atlas money line plus 105 then the Sunday games, you've got the Chaos and the Outlaws, formerly the Chrome. I'm going to go, at, uh, excuse me, Chaos money line at minus 120 here, uh, because I think that unlike years past where the Chaos were without a lot of their NLL guys for the first, you know, three weeks of the regular season, whatever it was, I don't believe they have that same issue going in to this season here in 2024. And I think that when you look at a team like the Outlaws, again, formerly the Chrome, after losing guys like Colin Heacock and Jackson Morrill on the offensive side of things, I just, I wonder early on how much firepower they'll be able to produce with Wisnowskis, Brennan O'Neill, and Sam Hanley. Um, especially in the early part of this season going straight ahead in week one against a very physical, bruising defense like the Chaos like to play and that brick wall in the goal known as Blaze Reardon. So again, I've got the Chaos money line minus 120. And then the final game of week one, again, the Atlas get a double dip because it's at their home field. They'll take on the Whip Snakes on Sunday afternoon. I'm going to take the Whip Snakes money line minus 150. Again, these lines coming from DraftKings because the Atlas will be on the second day of a back-to-back, -back, as we've now established, against a team that historically they haven't really fared all that well against in the Whip Snakes. So again, kind of second day of a back-to-back -back and against a team that you really have to make sure that you're prepared for, you get up for in the Whip Snakes. So I think that that's just a tough task to ask them to do you know, not even 24 hours after going up against another really solid team end to end in the cannons. So I think that at least for me as an Atlas fan, if the Atlas can even go one and one in this opening weekend, I won't have too much issue with it. If they go zero and two, then yeah, I'll be a little disappointed, but we can get to that with uh, next Monday's episode if and when that is the case but that'll do it for this episode of taking the field with stevie mac make sure to like comment and share on this episode let me know what you guys thought about anything we went over in this episode again segment one we talked about the water dogs midfield especially their offensive midfield from that article by wyatt miller second segment of the show we talked some pll fantasy i gave you guys my lineup for week one i'd love to hear what you guys have for week one for your fantasy lineups also touched on that article by PLL fantasy expert Paul LaMonica. And then here in segment three, I gave you my picks for 
week one just to kind of give you that quick rundown again that was Kieran McCardle over three and a half points the Atlas money line against the Cannons in their first game the Chaos money line against the Outlaws and then again to round things out Whip Snakes against Atlas give me the Whip Snakes money line at minus 150 but that'll do it for me guys I'll talk to you later